Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MS Pierce. This is the Ukraine War News Update, second part thereof for the 13th of November 2024, if you discount my breaking news update. We have a fair amount to discuss with regard to what's going on in the world of military aid to Ukraine. We are in a very chaotic period where there's a lame duck presidency in the US. You've got a transition going on. You've got a very... Um, it appears that the new administration coming in is not going to be supporting Ukraine militarily in any kind of way, shape or form. Uh, we've already had Mike Johnson say there is no intention for an appropriations bill to be table to to be tabled there to be put put down in congress uh, there is it appears no intention from that we can see from any of the other uh, interlocutors uh, and appointees uh, concerning trump administration to do anything really for ukraine that doesn't involve kind of forcing them to the negotiating table uh, that appears to be the main um, option my one hope is and and you can see a potential for this is that Putin might ruin it for himself. There's a big game between two kind of autocratic players really here. I, I'd say Trump is autocratic and Putin is clearly autocratic. And they are, they both want to be big personalities on the world stage. Putin doesn't want to have to dance to the tune of Trump. So he's going to be in an interesting situation where he is going to want to get as much territory as he possibly can in order that Russia are in a very commanding position with regard to negotiations, but but also doesn't want to be forced to negotiations by, by Trump because that will make him look weak to his own people, etc., etc. And we are starting to see Russian propagandists insult and mock Trump on national television. Uh, they've shown naked pictures of Melania Trump. There's more mocking of Trump to, over the last 24 hours. That might not play well with, with Trump so that he ends up getting really annoyed with Putin. And that, that actually plays into Zelensky's hands, whereby he's not the one that, that's being difficult. Although I think there's potential for that because forcing negotiations on a country that's been invaded requires forcing them to accept things they don't want and they they have their own sense of agency and sovereignty that is being um rendered irrelevant um and and it, it is almost like this is a bilateral agreement between the US and Russia bypassing Ukraine so they might have something to say about this but if if that bilateral interaction between the US and Russia ends up with Russia getting really peed off with Pu with Trump and Trump getting really peed off with Putin, then you might get the US being forced to uh, support Ukraine on account of Russia's actions, not on account of Ukraine's actions. Interesting. Anyway, Joe Biden's administration would increase its support for Ukraine in the months leading up to Donald Trump's return to the presidency. So you've got just over two months now. Um, they will seek to strengthen NATO in the meantime. So what you're going to have here is Trump, uh, sorry, Biden's administration trying to put things in place, not only to support Ukraine, as in we've got a bunch of money left over. That's all you're going to get. Here you go. Here's everything. Some people have been saying, well, that's really frustrating. They should have been given that already. I think that there is a sense to this, which is in the event that Trump gets in, then actually we need to make sure there's something left in the tank for the end of this year and going forward. If we can, if we can um, apportion that aid not and formally pledge it and, and get things in place so that's on the way there at these different points in time, then put some orders in with USAI, then actually you are guaranteed aid beyond the beginning of the Trump administration, assuming that they can't stop that and they wouldn't want to stop that. It's a bit of an if there. Whereas if they'd spent all that aid already, they'd have nothing left now. So that you can see there might be arguments as to why they have done done it the way they've done it. But the other thing I think you're going to see is the Biden administration try and put things in place with regard to agreements with NATO that perhaps might be difficult to undo by Trump. I don't know what that might be. I have no idea, really. But I would have thought there would be some some checks and balances or some fail safes put in place by the Biden administration 
to kind of protect the US's involvement with NATO. Um, yeah. Now, Pat Ryder from the Pentagon says, we are going to continue to rush aid and use the funds that we have to ensure that Ukraine gets what it needs in order to deter and fight against Russian aggression. Um, so that's his position. Uh, and indeed, the Pentagon has clarified the amount left for Ukraine's military assistance. So there's approximately $7.1 billion left in PDA, Presidential Drawdown Authority, where they can take US stocks and give them directly to Ukraine. Uh, so with that, that includes $4.3 billion approved by Congress in April, and then another $2.8 billion that became available after certain recalculations. So there's your $7.1 billion worth of kit. That would be book value of kit. Some people have suggested they could try and mess around with that. I don't know that there's scope to be able to do that. In principle, it sounds easy, but actually it's all very tightly monitored. And um, yeah, I don't know that they want to play with fire there. There's also approximately $2.2 billion available under the USAI program. So that's $2.2 billion worth of kit they can order. I would imagine they're going to be thinking in terms of um patriot interceptors maybe patriot air defense maybe jasm the thing is you've got f-16s on the way to ukraine and with a lack of aid coming going forward then actually how are you going to arm those f-16s so when you've got these cruise missiles that they've been given the go-ahead for you would have thought well they'll be consistently coming in in uh, forthcoming appropriations packages and, and whatnot uh, yeah, aid packages. Well, if those aid packages are going to stop, then they're going to need to stock up on JASMs and you know these American cruise missiles for the F-16s and other munitions for the F-16s. So, I, I'd imagine quite a lot of that ordering uh, rather than PDA. I don't know. I don't know what the stockpiles of JASMs are. Might be a mixture of both, but it's probably going to be a lot of interceptors, a lot of missiles. Um, I think will be given to Ukraine. Uh, hopefully a lot of Bradleys and uh, strikers and whatnot as well. We know that there's another 212 strikers on the way, another 2,000 Humvees. Bradleys and Abrams would be very useful, I would have thought, as well. Now, Anthony Blinken has vowed that North Korean involvement in the war, quote, will get a firm response, according to Sky News. They get a slap on the wrist, you naughty, naughty boys. USA statement, uh, department, State Department sorry, confirmed yesterday that North Korean soldiers had actively joined fighting alongside Russian forces in the Kursk region. Uh, that's more than 10,000 troops. So there is a recognition that they're there, that they are fighting. They're now on the front line. The US State Department has admitted that. Question is, what are you going to do about it? They will, they will get a firm response. I have no idea what that would entail. But my goodness, it, it's, it should have come already, uh, really. I mean, it should be like, you've crossed the red line, right, this is happening. So let's talk about it, let's see, let's... Nah, nah, nah. It needs to be a strength of, of conviction. Right, Ukraine has received a $1.35 billion grant from the US to support humanitarian and social programs, according to Prime Minister Denis Shmihal. I don't know how that money gets to Ukraine. I don't know if there's strings attached, etc., etc., but that'll be certainly... Um, uh, well received. Now, Shashank Joshi from The Economist says, in an, in an instructive podcast published six days ago with Pete Hegseth, Trump's nominee for the Secretary of Defence position, there are a few takeaways. Now, I'm including this because it pertains to military aid, uh, tangentially. Pete Hegseth is this Fox News presenter who has got the job of, of that Lloyd Austin is doing as Secretary of Defence. The, a guy that is, is completely unqualified for the job. I mean, I'm super worried about this. It's a massive, massive job he has. Three million people employed by the Department of Defense. You have a budget of almost $900 billion, and you've put in someone that's been presenting for Fox News. Fox Breakfast. Not even, like, properly going to news, really. Just, um, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's, it's really problematic. Anyway, Hegseth has said, I would probably talk a lot about the military-industrial complex, the companies that influence the way we procure weapons and the way we fight. Well, there's the veterans industrial complex too, allow the private market to provide for vets. The VA hates that. The budget of the VA is twice that, the size of the Marine Corps, massive, massive. It's the second largest federal department in the federal government, and yet VA, you can't be seen in a timely manner and you get treated like a number. So he's talking about... Um, privatizing the VA, uh, which is a, a very big thing, 
He criticizes traditional vets organizations. So he could end up annoying a number of vets or he could end up getting people, yeah, it does need reform, blah, blah, blah. But I think there's going to be this real ideological kind of blowtorch being taken to everything, including like the VA. So it could go all right. But the, the reason I mention that here is because just tangentially talking about military industrial complex, and I wonder whether there might be uh, a bit of a tension that, that could develop between the military industrial complex in the US and the people now slated to run the DOD. And it'd be interesting to see what effect this might. I mean, at the end of the day, surely the US government wants to make money or no, sorry, not them make money. They want their economy to do well. And a significant part of their economy is a military industrial complex. And as I've said before, that isolationism means that there will be fewer people from, say, Europe and, and in NATO who are going to be as up for buying from the US, especially with the uh, strategic... Uh, outlook for the EU where they have to they're hoping to procure 60% of their military equipment from within inside the EU it means that the military industrial complex in the US might take a bit of a hit and then if you go down this isolationist route and then take a blowtorch to like the DOD and relationships between the military industrial complex which is you know you can argue something needs to happen etc etc but I think you're going to have this desire from these ideologues within the GOP that are coming in the Trump administration incoming that are just going to uh, tear up everything. And in within that chaos, there will not be stability. And without stability, you wonder how the US is going to be able to support Ukraine if it needs to, in what capacity it can support Ukraine. Will there be a lack of desire to buy stuff from the US? Um, because wrapped up with support packages to Ukraine, of course, is the Department of Defense's understanding that that equipment, so that PDA, that presidential drawdown stuff that goes to Ukraine, then needs to be replaced with newer stuff that it, this acts as an economic stimulus and the stimulus to upgrade the American defenses. Now, if you suddenly take that away, then the US now is like, oh, we were doing a really good job of upgrading our, our military capacity and capabilities and now less so so now we are still stuck with 6,000 Bradleys that we could have got rid of and and expedited a replacement thereof and used the US sorry used the Ukraine funding as a way to replace our obsolete equipment now that's gone because they just think it was giving money to Ukraine well it wasn't just giving money to Ukraine it was stimulating the US economy and and sorting out our own defensive capabilities. Anyway, uh, it's really interesting to listen to Ed Davey here. It's the leader of the Lib Dems in Parliament in the UK being very strong here in his condemnation of Donald Trump Jr., who, remember, released that thing on Instagram that said, I don't know why he chose 38 days, but Zelensky's got 38 days before his allowance stops and all these these this money coming down on Zelensky's head. And he is the son of Donald Trump, and you'd assume that this kind of thinking is, permeates around that, that inner circle. Um, but if I may turn to the war in Ukraine, uh, Mr. Speaker. Look at his lapel, Ed Davey. You've got a lot of time for that. A senior advisor to President elect Trump, Donald Trump Jr., has shared a post <laughs> on Instagram. It's interesting that people are laughing. This is in Parliament in the UK. People are laughing at Donald Trump Jr. So if you're a big fan of, of the Trump administration, if you like your Donald Trump, then ju just be, be aware that you may love him, but you know there's a, bit, a little bit of disdain for Trump generally in politics around the world. If you go outside the 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 world of of Nigel Farage, um, but here we have like Lib Dems are the the third biggest party in in the UK Parliament, you've got Labour, had a massive majority. Then you've got Tories, the Conservative Party, who took a real big hit. And Lib Dems are only a, a short way behind them, really. And so they are a major player in the UK political scene. <laughs> On Instagram, that declares that President Zelensky will soon, within the next few weeks, lose his allowance. If the Trump administration does withdraw support from our brave Ukrainian allies, Will the UK and Europe step up to fill the gap? Will he seize frozen Russian assets, not just the interest, but the assets underlying that? 
so we can fund a huge boost to the Ukrainian forces in their fight against Putin's war machine. This is really interesting because there's now this growing move to get that $300 billion not just being used to underwrite loan repayments. So they're loaning lots of money to... Um, and this is the G7 arranging this, and you've got this happening in Japan, in the EU, in the UK, in Canada, and in the US. So you've got those five entities using the frozen Russian R Russian assets in different places to underwrite these loans to Ukraine to the tune of $50 billion of loans, which should take place over several years, right? That's $50 billion and the frozen Russian assets will stay there and the the profits from them is what you pay back the loan. So the Ukrainians don't have to pay back the loan. You take the profits from your frozen Russian assets and that you will do that to the tune of $50 billion and then you'll be left with $300 billion at the end, or worth of assets at the end of, of that anyway. But a lot of people are saying we need to give that whole $300 billion to Ukraine. Uh, and kind of somehow liquefy those assets and and send that to Ukraine. So instead of getting fifty billion dollars, they get three hundred billion dollars. Mr. Speaker, as he knows, um, we've been resolute and strong in our support for Ukraine in the face of Russian aggression. And I have been speaking, as he will know, in recent weeks with other leaders about how we put Ukraine in the best and strongest possible position. Uh, at this time, and I'll continue those discussions. Thank you. So it doesn't answer that. And uh, to be honest, I don't blame him for not answering that because that will be a huge discuss discussion that's going on between those entities. But it is being raised in Parliament there. And um, it was, as Tim White says, a completely non committal reply. It absolutely. But the real politic of the situation is you're not going to answer that yes or no. You're going to be saying we are we are working to put them in the best position. I, I, there will probably be an awful lot of arguments as to why you can't or shouldn't do that. Most of them appear to be kind of legal arguments that if you those three hundred billion dollars, if you give them away, then then that is. Uh, you, you are opening yourself up to loads of legal ramifications. But it could also be a long-term thing, such that it's a bit like privatising industries in in any country, right? As a kind of like, we need to get this off the national... Um, or, or similar, actually, what Norway did with regard to oil reserves in the North Sea, which is we need a long-term thing whereby we can keep providing. So we if we, rather than just say, yeah, you, we're going to sell this national entity off and get a cash cow, it's a cash cow and we suddenly got loads of money, but actually 10 years' time, we're now having to pay out for those services ourselves. Or instead of just saying, yeah, BP, you can have all of these oil reserves and we'll occasionally tax you, but actually you get away with x y and z and moving money around and that's quite difficult actually we're going to take that cut on a long-term basis going forward this is a similar thing it could be that actually to feed off the profits from that is, is far more sustainable in supporting ukraine over over a longer period so i don't know there, there will undoubtedly be arguments for and against that. i'm not trying to like defend a non-answer from the prime minister i mean we're so used to seeing that in the house of, house of parliament anyway but house of commons but um i can I can understand why he says that. I'm sure those discussions are going on. Now, interestingly, NATO's military committee chair, Rob Bauer, has stated that if Russia were, in fact, should we listen to him? I'm absolutely sure if the Russians did not have nuclear weapons, we would have been in Ukraine, kicking them out. We would have. But they have nuclear weapons, so it's not the same as in Afghanistan. I'm absolutely. And we all know this, but it's really nice to have it kind of spelt out very explicitly, which is we would have kept Russia out of Ukraine like that. But they got nuclear weapons. So what, at the end of the day, the, re the reason NATO exists is because Russia has nuclear weapons, right? So, you know, if they didn't have nuclear weapons, you wouldn't have a NATO, arguably. So, but all these counterfactuals aside, in principle, NATO would have been in there at the drop of a hat. It's Russia having nuclear weapons. And that's why NATO or allied nations have shot down Iranian drones and missiles uh, coming towards Israel because Iran doesn't have nuclear weapons, but they've not done the same 
for Iranian drones and missiles traveling towards Ukraine from Russian silos. So uh, if it were all launches, if it were not for nuclear weapons in Russia, the West would already be at war against Russia. Absolutely sure. Yeah. So as we just heard, that was just a, a, a transcription, a bit, bit of a longer transcription there. So yeah, interesting. Okay. NATO will provide military assistance to Ukraine on a scale that ensures the Ukrainian armed forces are prepared to continue fighting in 2025, according to US Secretary of State uh, Antony Blinken following a meeting with NATO Secretary Mark Rutter. Quote, the purpose of this visit is to focus our efforts on ensuring that Ukraine has the funds, ammunition and mobilised forces to fight effectively in 2025 or to be able to enter negotiations from a position of strength, he stated. So this is all good news. That's all exactly how I would expect this to have been. But we just haven't provided enough, uh, quickly enough, and we keep putting restrictions on the Ukrainians. It's insane. The Ukrainians would be in a much stronger position now if we hadn't tied up their hands behind their backs. And that... that the Biden administration absolutely failed in that in that respect. Like, but, but I don't think I've got it here. There is new, more news coming out today. Uh, yesterday, it came out to suggest that they had uh, they had evaluated that there was a fifty percent chance that Russia was going to use a nuke. And I've said this before: is like you need to understand why the anti-escalation rhetoric is there, and they are privy to information that we are not. So it's easy for us to say, oh, yeah, I would have done that. Russians wouldn't have done anything. But actually, they had evaluated there's a 50% chance of the Russians using nukes. And had that been the case, you can understand why they were genuinely afraid of stepping over red lines. So it is, you know, is a real issue there. Now, we can say in hindsight, well, they didn't use nukes. So therefore, what are you worrying about? Uh, and of course, hindsight vision is always 2020. Uh, but you're playing around with the, the the most catastrophic thing that can happen on Earth, essentially, uh, in 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 like the quickest amount of time. And so you can understand like trying to be a little bit careful about that. But it, it is this argument that obviously is is you, you're not going to solve it. There are all sorts of counterfactuals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this under underwrites why this underwrites the American behaviour. Uh, what's in, important going forward is that the US aren't, hopefully, aren't as afraid as they were and restrictions are lifted. Now, moving on, the Finnish Foreign Minister uh, or the Finnish Minister of Foreign Trade and Development has announced a 20 million euro uh, package to support educational reform in Ukraine, as well as 500,000 euros to reform school meals. So that's Finland coming up with the goods there. Thank you, Finland. Um, Taiwan. Now, lots of people talking about these 15 batteries of Taiwanese Hawk air defense systems that supposedly or possibly have ended up in Ukraine. Lots of people sort of discussing that yesterday, including myself. We don't know. The, the, in the Forbes articles, may have rearmed. There are some people saying that didn't happen. There's no way that happened. So this source saying Taiwan almost certainly did not deliver 15 batteries of Hawks to Ukraine. It would take multiple years to train enough crews abroad to staff this many systems. It does seem likely Taiwan delivered something Hawk related though. I would say that's probably more realistic because I said yesterday to have, what was it, six launches per battery and 15 batteries is 90 launches. How many people do you need to man those launchers and the radar systems and, and all the other parts of the hawk batteries it's it's i think that's quite an ask so maybe they've given them and maybe the training is taking place somewhere and we just don't know about it but to to think that you've got 15 batteries operational in ukraine now is probably unlikely so what has happened i don't know but remember there are always two sides to a coin so there is that. Okay. EU has delivered over 980,000 shells to Ukraine so far, and they're hoping at 1.5 million uh, by the end of the year. So that's really impressive, although not what they had promised originally. But generally, you know, that is ramping up. That is getting Ukraine an awful lot of ammunition here. So Francois Heisberg says a real European success. The EU now produces more 155 mil shells than the US does, even if it's still not enough and the picture isn't the same in other areas of war production. But the assumption that the European defence industrial base can't ramp up is plain wrong. So actually looking at the good news here, then you have a situation whereby 
everyone was saying, oh, Europe can't do this or won't be able to do this. Oh, look at them. They failed. They didn't do a million by May. But actually, they have done quite a lot and they have ramped up and it is looking better. And actually, there is more sustainable support for Ukraine going forward. Now, the challenge for Ukraine is still going to be personnel. I am deeply worried about the Eastern Front Line, about it essentially crumbling and the Russians overcoming them. But the Russians also have the same issues. If the desertion rates are as high as people are saying with regard to Ukrainian troops, then that is a massive worry. When are they going to get these other units that are being trained up, say, in France at the moment? So you've got a big old unit getting trained up there, the Anne uh, of Kiev unit. Uh, you've got... Uh, this you've got another 600 people have signed up have they in Poland how long would it take to get them trained up and usable and so on and so forth we the Ukrainians desperately need troops it appears that they're getting enough weaponry and enough money at the moment although they still need more weaponry they're getting certain amounts of weaponry that are enough they need more missiles and long-range drones they need to saturate the skies with missiles and drones and hit everything they can in in russia and do that without the ability without the restrictions so we will see the german city of leipzig says uh, German aid to Ukraine is currently carrying out the delivery of a man 4520 crane truck worth 63,000 euros to its Ukrainian twin city of Kiev. The truck is perfectly suitable for rescue work and clearing debris and was specifically requested by the Ukrainian capital. So while there's all this military aid still uh, being given to Ukraine, there's still a, a number of other ways that Ukraine can get equipment. So often twin cities help. I know France this is a big thing with medical equipment. Um, Germany, they do this a lot as well, and other nations too. Um, interesting, Zolushny, who's the ambassador to the UK now, says Ukraine is negotiating with Great Britain to train five to 7,000 students annually for future civil service roles. So there are many ways that the UK or any country can aid Ukraine. It's not often just in training soldiers and training uh, and giving military equipment, but it's also training civil service um, personnel and so on and so forth so that they can function uh, as well as possible in Ukraine. Good stuff there. Now, talking about different ways of getting equipment to Ukraine, military donations in Ukraine have fallen sharply amid rising financial pressures and war weariness with major charities reporting drops by 20% or more in 2024, according to Bloomberg. This is a real challenge for the Ukrainians. War fatigue is a thing. I mean, I'm amazed that you guys are still here with me. Uh, it is such a challenge to keep people caring about the war in Ukraine. And when you have these political winds blowing in places like the US, that's going to mess around. It's changing the narrative over there. And the government, there will be a top-down proliferation of narrative that will essentially be anti-Ukraine or at least not pro supporting Ukraine or be pro forced peace and you'll get people all over the news talking about this and then people will pick up on that in the general you've got Musk and David Sachs uh, propagating false narratives all over social media that narrative changes people's opinions and that affects how whether they give to charity. So it's a real shame for Ukraine. I, th I absolutely detest human beings like David Sachs uh, and indeed Elon Musk. And it's, it's why I be you, you look at my threat, uh, look at my tabs up here. How many are now blue butterflies? Blue sky is where I'm trying to migrate to. And it's really great that at blue sky, there are now uh, huge numbers of the OSINT community. Uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago, when I, I was railing about Elon Musk and people, some of my friends were like, well, just get off Twitter. And lots of you were saying that. I was like, I literally can't. It is the only platform that allows me to do what I do f for the work that I do. There is no other comparable uh, platform. Blue Sky is now getting there. There's a kind of critical mass of open source intelligence sources there that are allowing me to get as you can see 50 percent plus of, of my sourcing can now take place on blue sky and as it has its challenges there you can only have one minute videos on there and other things i'm sure that will change uh, but it is certainly a, a better place it has better moderation it's just um you know you can actually block people and not have to have people shouting in your face that you don't want shouting in your face um so yeah I, i'm trying to move over there and i and i suggest you guys if you're interested do so as well uh, there are loads of great so if you check my 
I don't know how you would see this, but if you, um, yeah, I have a list that I use uh, that is my Ukraine war update list. Uh, so when I go to my home, I have these different lists up here. These are from other people. This is my own list and it has most of the sources I have from Twitter. So you guys can check the same sources I use. You can access my list. I'm sure you can import it in some way. Um, and yeah, it's, it's becoming useful for me. So the Kiev Independent, for example, 54 seconds ago, Ukrainian Foreign Minister has met with the US Secretary of State in Brussels for bilateral talks. That's taking place. Um, and that military donations one, uh, which I, I've i literally just spoken to you about, is is now, so that was probably on Twitter previously, or anyway, that's, that's now there. So anyway, you get the point. Yeah, here it was on Twitter. So a bit of a delay from putting it on Twitter to putting it there, but it's all good. Um, over the past, past week, Russia had been gathering forces in what appears to be preparations for a decisive push in the country's Kursk Oblast. Now, I talked about this previously. You've got 50,000 troops up there. The reason this is in the military aid is because we need to kind of work out what military provision Russia has for an offensive like that. So they are re relying on troops from North Korea in order to do that. Are, have, what's the training looking like uh, and what's the equipment provision looking like? Now, we know there's been a tremendous attrition of Russian equipment in that particular sector. Um, are, they have drawn from other areas of the front line, but North Korean troops have meant that they don't necessarily have to do that to the degree that the Ukrainians would have wanted, but the Ukrainians are holding on to Kursk with gritted teeth. Then when we see little anecdotes like this, this is in a military aid section because uh, you'll see. So War Translated says a Russian soldier captured in the Kursk zone signed his contract on October the 15th. So it's less than a month ago. Arriving all the way from Baratia drunk. With just four days of training, he was assigned to the elite 810th Brigade. So these are, that's a naval infantry brigade. I talked to you about in at the beginning of the war, before this war started, your Marines and your paratroopers, so the VDV and the, the Marines, the paratroopers and the Marines, would have taken their troops from pre-existing units of the conventional conventional army units and said, right, who are your best troops? Right, we're going to take him, 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 and him. And take your already trained troops and place them in your VDV or Naval Infantry Brigade troop uh, units. You then take those already trained troops who are really good and you give them elite training. So they are now crack troops and they are better than new conventional troops. What happened since the beginning of the war is the 810th is a good example of this, but you've got the 155th, the 44th. These were units that were absolutely mauled in places like Vukhledar and Krinki. And 810th in Krinki, those other two in Vukhledar. And they were, so I think it was, 150, was it 155th that were... Um, reconstituted like nine times so you're like okay we've been mauled we've lost 20 percent of our troops we need to go and get 20 percent troops and everyone's fighting and it's all a bit mental so we just have to get whoever we can get so we get them from convicts or from mobilized or volunteers that are coming in but these are people who haven't been trained up they aren't the creme de la creme these are just randos that we've got and we're throwing them in there and so then that's 20 percent dilution and then you get reconstituted again because you get mauled and you become less effective so as you become less effective you get a higher chance of getting mauled so it's this, it's this vicious cycle whereby these units then get diluted and diluted and diluted and diluted and diluted and diluted so then you get to the stage where the 810th up in kursk is getting absolutely hammered up there and they are getting a Russian soldier who signed a contract on the 15th, four days of training, arrives in Kursk and gets captured. Four days of training in an elite crack unit. So that's why I've included this in the military aid section and the kind of like what equipment people have and what training people have. It's clear here that the training is substandard for well, I'm not subscribed uh subscribe um it, I'm not uh, following I see uh is, is, is substandard for the Russians here so you know uh is that something that one can extrapolate across the Kursk units uh 
I would probably think so. Uh, and then you have North Koreans who some people are saying are poorly trained for the job at hand. It's not the kind of warfare they're trained in and it's not the uh, and they don't speak the language and the equipment and et cetera, et cetera. So it is is not although the Russians is although it's not easy for the Ukrainians. Right. And they are totally stretched and their morale is going to be low and it, it, it's got awful on on front lines. But the Russians are also massively suffering and they're, they're operating in a suboptimal way, suboptimal training, suboptimal equipment, uh, procurements, uh, suboptimal conditions, etc., etc. So not easy for them either. Anyway, thank you. That's enough from me. Quite a big one today. Lots to talk about. Take care. Speak soon.